Uh, Joanna, I thought I'd start the interview by asking you how you came to write poetry. Well, um, it just happened. I mean, when I was about 13, I suppose, I wrote my first poem, which was shocking, called how I Want to Be in England or to Live in England, and by Joanne Burns, aged 13 years, 10 months, but I don't know where it is, <laughs> so I don't have to look at it. But um, when I started to write poetry, not for publication or anything, but just the impulse, I remember it well because it was... Um, at the end of my first year university, 63, and we did, you know, the history of English poetry, Penguin, um, and, you know, going through the poems that were set for study, Dunn, Marvell, etc., I started to just sit and write. I was sitting on the divan in the sunroom looking out at the harbour, and I'd start writing these poems, which, of course, were like, you know, terrible versions of um, the history of English poetry in the Elizabethan era plus. And uh, I just sort of wrote a whole lot, but not all the time. And they were pretty bad, of course. But that's when I started writing. And, um, but in my early years, like from 17 onwards, I was more interested in theatre at the time. Particularly, I used to read a lot of plays and go to theatre. And I won't give a whole list, but you know, the things that people went to and read in the early 60s from Beckett to Albie, Genet, Pinter, etc., etc., And, uh, you know, theatre was very cheap in those days. They could go to lots of theatre very cheaply as a student. Largely absurdist. Um, and absurdist, plays. a lot of absurdist mm -hmm. plays. And, and Brecht and um, a whole range of like Tennessee Williams. But they had the Wayside Chapel Theatre, for example, which was very good then. I saw a lot of good plays there. And, um, but somehow, um, I used to like to sing and play guitar as well, but somehow poetry seemed to come back, although I went to some you know, drama um, summer schools and I did a bit of acting, but poetry started to come back and um, I read different different poets then. And Which then there was, you know, the Penguin started to bring out those um, beautiful European poets, Gunter Grass I liked and Holub and Herbert, the uh, Polish poet, etc. And um, then there was a poetry of pop started. It was from England, that anthology I really liked. And I was teaching by that time, my first year teaching, Sydney Boys High. And I even gave up, a, got a, a poetry prize in my class, the best poem that I gave, the poetry of pop. So I got really into that sort of pop poetry as well as do you the remember European. The, do you remember the poets of that? Um, well, in that little book was um, Adrian Henry, Brian Patton and Roger McGough who I saw when, when I went to England later, which I'll speak about. Um, but at the same time, I really like um, some of the Gunter Grass poems, We Live in the Egg, sort of very dry and sharp, sort of um, amusing ironies. I like those European poets, the ones in translation. And as time went by, and I was, I think I just knew I had to write poetry and I had to leave the country to do it. And I wanted to go to, to overseas. so. In about, I was about 24 then, I sort of broke my teaching bond, which you had five year bonds in those days, and I did three years in a, a term and went off um, to Greece first, which I was always passionate about, to having studied ancient history, particularly Greek, and I did honours in ancient history in the Greek um, fifth century, was focused on. So I went to Greece first, and then to London, where of course I um, was a burgeoning kind of performance pop poetry also I mean I heard I saw Randolph Stowe as well you know from Randolph Stowe to Patti Smith in those <laughs> years I was there several years so there was a whole lot of poets I went to see and it was very buzzy and um but when I left Australia I did have some I decided I would type up my favorite poems from Hopkins and Dylan Thomas in my terrible typing and carry them around in my bag the typed versions of a few of each other poems. So poetry was always there with me, and I never opened it up, but I had to have it. What there. did you get from Hopkins and Dylan Thomas? Oh, I think the language. The language yes. was fantastic, sort of um, edges and sharp. Sharp, well, I suppose In Dylan case, Thomas yeah. was um, a kind of um, celebratory use of words, like some of them, it seemed like cherries in a way, but I suppose he looked like a cherub, you know, but he was sort of fierce as well. And, they did do not go gentle and fire of London after the death of a child, but also Fern Hill and Hopkins, of course, was that um, having been um, a Catholic, gone to a Catholic schools, um, Hopkins 
gave another edge to the religious spiritual experience, the sort of anguish, but the language was so fantastic. I love that. Um, but I think I had to throw that influence off because it was too, too many textures of words for the, you know, the 1970s. So then I went to London and um, I wanted to write poetry and of course I went to many readings and then I also went to, with some friends, we went to stay in, in Portugal for several months and I started to, to write. And um, I wrote which, a poem which is um, one of my breakthrough poems, I think, because what I wanted, what I got out of the um, pop scene was getting, stripping back all the language and just having short, sharp, um, trim images with little word plays and games. It was a kind of playful thing and the idea of the throwaway poem which you have as in performance. And ironically enough, uh, this poem, which I always think in from my um, second book, well, it's in my second book, Rats, was also in my first book, which I'll mention in a minute, but I didn't bring it with me. Um, it's a very short one. I could call it the bitch poem, but it was a way I felt that I got somewhere where I wanted to start from, getting rid of the... Um, the language I'd been used to writing in my ones at university. And also, of course, when I did Deep Ed, I did a creative writing option. There was some little perk for the Friday afternoons. And I had a couple of poems published in their very beautifully named journal, Dry Light. <laughs> my first published poems, when one of them was just over the top, full of rubbishly sort of romantic, decadent images. So here I was now in London, seeing every all that language and that heritage of the the cliches which of course bad poetry gets from the history of poetry when you try and imitate it so this one to me um seemed to feel like a new way of writing she had more friends than you could fit into the back of a truck that's why she didn't mind leaving them parked on a cliff edge while she went for a stroll with the break in her pocket. Um, and, you know, of, of many early poems, that's the one I always feel really comfortable with still. Why? Read. Because of its, um, its sharpness, yeah, its, its implication. Yeah, and the visual and its, aspect. And, and its attitude as well. Yeah, yeah, and it's very short. It's actually um, in several small stanzas, mm. so it's very sparing. But I think it hits a, hits the um, nail on the head in a way. And it, obviously, not everything can be like that, but I felt that was a breakthrough of honing down and getting sharp movements. Um, now that poem was in my first book, Strange Feces. Now how that came about, this is a, an interesting story for me still, was I wanted to send some poems out. And then I was living in Kensington and there was a very good bookshop called the Turret Bookshop in Kensington Church Walk, full of poetry, just packed, beautiful old bookshop. And I looked in a lot of the magazines, the established ones were not for me, I knew that. And then I found this sort of Ronio um, Augustetnid magazine called Strange Feces, run by Opal and Ellen Nations, um, who live in Notting Hill. And I sent them some poems, and one, this was in um, early 72. I was coming back to Australia in the middle of, of that year. Um, and they came around and knocked on my door and said they wanted to publish some of my poems in their magazine. And then he said, Opal said, if you type them up, some poems will do a Gestet in the Day um, full capsized book. So that became my first book um, stra from Strange Feces Press called Snatch. And uh, it didn't have an ISBN or anything, but you know, it sold at 50p. But I think now it's been sold to a couple of university libraries here for about $130, so it was a sort of funny mm. little story. But that was my first book, and a lot of those poems came when I went to Portugal with friends and we stayed in this outside the fishing village in an old house. And your I wrote early, a lot um, of these, yeah. yeah. Your, your early um, publications were very much uh, bound up with the small press scene, uh, first in London and then presumably back in Sydney, and also particularly, I think, with women's presses. Yeah. Um, I just wondered how important to you was the women's movement at that time? Well, they became um, very important in the 70s. Um, now, what happened was when I came back to us, my first reading I did was in London at the turret, not the turret, the, um, uh, the Troubadour coffee shop in 
which still has readings today. And when I read there just a few poems, this was not long after I copied the first book in London, about April 72, a man in the audience said that his friend in Sydney, Patricia Laird, was um, setting up a new press, a Saturday club with a magazine, Saturday Club Book of Poetry. And so he said, why don't I send her my, my first book, Snatch? And I sent it to her, and when I got back, she wanted to publish some more poems. So a lot of the poems that were in Snatch, the first Ronio one, ended up in Rats, which was my first um, book in Australia. Um, and he went on to publish also um, Adrenaline Flick Knife, which, speaking of the feminist, um, there's a lot of my sort of feminist rage poems from the 70s with um, section title like High Beam Blatancy. Um, there, this is a book that became a sort of um, 70s um, out there kind of poli politics, both feminist and um, criticising religion. And I've got poems like Poems for the Street Boys, which was a kind of um, my sort of signature feminist anger at men on, on um, curvy sites read? whistling. Oh, okay. Poem for the Street Boys, I always like to read that. Um, you want me to read it? I haven't read it for many years. But Is that, that, that move, but Patricia Laird did the, the press, the Saturday Club. She had a magazine, then she started publishing poets, and she published like Ray Jones, Philip Hamill, myself, Stephanie Bennett, etc., Berwyn Lewis. But um, her husband was an actor, and he also, well, they were involved with the press. But this, this book, Adrenaline Flick Knife, as you can see, was very, um, very out there with a lot of kind of um, dramatic kind of language. And in this book, I do use capitals within the poems for certain important or words that seem significant or just because they're uppercase anyway. But the um, but I changed to no capitals a few years later. Why? Because I thought that the words should have their own significance and not anything be privileged by the capitals so that they would give a, a different way of seeing An things. equality. Yes, I call that the level playing field. The level playing field. Um, so each word didn't have its um, self-imposed um, in sort of significance. Well, so from, from this book, Adrenaline Flick Knife, um, this was a poem I used to like to read at readings in the 70s because that was the whole period of, um, of feminism coming out in the streets and um, making itself heard. And this came from the experience of walking past um, men on building sites whistling, etc. Poem for the street boys. The big boys, never nervy on the safe end of their pneumatic vibrators, drilling more holes for the hot and sticky bitumen gangbang between the hours of eight and four, five days a week only, you understand. We work to rules and regulations, drilling holes for the broad highway. Just increase the pressure. She can take it, sport. We can fill her up, just load it in. She'll be fit for riding over after lunch. Such potency, big boys. Does your chromosome coffee charge the strength in your stringy beans? 43 wanks in every cup. In between sperm stories, they munch on the corned beef of mateship sandwiches. How their calluses might ache from the generous slaps on the back. How the muscles make the man, my dear, all the better to walk tall with. Little Red Riding Anger marches round the corner with her hood full of hate, hoping to avoid the whistles, but the wolves are rarely late. She knows the story blindfold, can translate it into 16 varieties of Australian realism. The conversation grows erect. Their tools work well. Road maintenance cannot afford slack workers in the busy traffic of blind glands. Is that last word glance or glands? Glands. Uh, glands, blind glands. Mm. Um, you said that uh, uh, that collection, Adrenaline Flick Knife, also uh, had poems which argued with religion. You, you had quite a religious, a Catholic upbringing, I think. I had a Catholic upbringing, but um, I didn't have a devout Catholic upbringing. My father was agnostic and my mother um, wasn't a devout Catholic by any means, although we went to church, but she didn't always go. But I think I, um, I had an awareness of the, um, some of the hypocrisies of religion 
also because, you know, with my, when my parents got married, mixed marriages, you had to get married behind the altar. So in wartime, my parents had to get married behind the altar at Edgecliff, St. Joseph's. So you always got another view of what, you know, the kind of generosity of the church and what it, it lacked. So I, th I was thinking this morning about that, that maybe that started my, um, the bit of an edge I had about the church from the beginning. Um, and so I wrote this section of poems in the Kitchens of Christ, and uh, some of the poems are a bit too, too knotted now, but I particularly like a poem I wrote about a nun, which is a quite a sad poem um, about Sister Promesina of the Poor. But I won't read it, but that was a kind of poem. I still feel it, um, feel the... Um, passion I had about this poem and how nuns were treated in the church. And I don't suppose it has changed, but not enough. It's called Divine Matrimonial. So that was the, the one I liked most of that series still. It still has some resonance for me. Um, but I feel like that quarrel with religion um, wasn't complete and that um, often in your poems, uh, particularly those which invoke um, objects and things, there's a kind of... Um, searching for imminence, uh, that's a word that you actually use yourself. So uh, I wondered uh, just um, to what extent this idea of imminence uh, still um, persists in your poetry. Well, yes, well, also, it also it does persist in a sort of spiritual way in some poems, like my previous book, To Brush, Amphora, I had an Australia Council grant to explore religion and the spiritual, and um, I did some poems on dealing with saints, of course, which as part of your Catholic training, you get to revere and love the saints and they've got very glowing pictures, lots of coloured pictures, and they do have an imminence sort of imposed on them by the stories, the narratives and the myths of the saints, great, great uh, features and um, ways that they showed their love of God. So that there's imminence in those traditional objects and in... in um, Amphora, I do sometimes enjoy, I mean they are meant to make you seduced by all these stories, so you get to revere these objects from the kind of um, the red where the lights in the church with the red glass that always glows. I mean you see, as a Catholic child, especially in primary school, you see that all the time, so you start to have a kind of love for these beautiful colours and objects and, and painted saints, so of course I've written about the saints sometimes in very playful ways and sometimes in more um, savage ways for the understory, the, the backstory of the saints. I, I feel also there's an element of that in your portrait poems, you know, the, the poems about, um, uh, you know, young guys on steroids or a cafe scene, um, stockbrokers in the city. Um, there's a kind of icon iconic quality uh, about the portraits, so that they, they... I suppose you get a kind of archetypal, but a lot of that arc iconic is... Um, iconic turns into an iconoclastic portrait. Oh, absolutely. Uh, like Ironically. Some, yeah, the irony, yeah, the irony. So the iconoclastic, breaking the icon of the, of the type or the figure yes. and looking at all the flaws, so to speak. But there's also a pleasure in doing that, I suppose, which is a kind of um, transferred pleasure from... The fascinate, there's a fascination as well as a, um, a kind of irritation. Like many, like many um, writers of your generation, you travelled in Asia, in India. Yeah. Um, was there a spiritual dimension to that as well? Yes, there was. Um, and, well, it was more like um, to measure up what I'd been um, practising or reading about and developing in the real the real country rather than the dream of the, the Eastern mysticism. And there's a lot of, in my book, um, On a Clear Day, there's a whole section called Palm Trees, which deals with um, the New Age sort of um, consciousness and looking at the body from various dimensions, not just the physical, but the etheric and astral, and I suppose Buddhic, those levels of awareness. And that section also looks at um, the body through, you know, um, for, palms, cards, eyes. The feet, the eyes, the nose, smelling, hearing. So there, yes, that um, I was very influenced in that and looking at 
different parts of the body and the consciousness beyond the body. And I suppose when I went to India, I saw a lot of things that didn't measure up with the sort of dream of the um, dream of the Eastern mysticism. I suppose it was like the reality and and the dream. You've also um, shown some interest in um, Greek mythology in your poetry. So, is there a kind of transferal, you know, I think from, so. Catholic, just... from Catholicism to the East, and then? Uh, to no, the I Greek, think the Greek or... came as it because I really loved um, studying Greek history at school. I did some yeah. at university as well, and I think it just. Um, I was thinking, looking through all my poems in the last week or so, how many times I do refer to a, a Greek deity in some way. And I think what I like about uh, the Greeks is a kind, of, a kind of organic from the elements, from the sky and the earth, and they're, they're, the, they sort of metamorphose, and there's so many different stories of what they do, and they represent many different attributes and qualities with the Greek gods. They're, and of course, in ancient Greece, of course, people might have been probably terrified of them, but we've had all that filtered away, and now we have the, the uh, more the fear which you develop as a Catholic education of the devil, etc. They're the kind of strictures and rule, religious rules, whereas the Greeks seem very free. But to the ancient Greeks, of course, there was the opposite. They were sort of, um, as, as Greek tragedy shows you in the plays, the gods were very powerful, but... I suppose it's a pleasure to play with the Greek gods and have their influences there because they seem part of um, nature as well, part of many things that manifest in the world um, and are there to play with, as, hmm. as um, I think many people have done. I've been uh, pursuing the line of spirituality because uh, it seems to me in many ways that your poems start at the opposite extreme, that is that they are extremely material and that there's a, a fascination with material objects and uh, not just objects but words as objects about the fascination with the materiality of language as well. Right. well and I wondered, um, I mean your collection Blowing Bubbles in the Seventh Lane, which in some ways was the, the pivotal collection I guess, um, you know, the uh, one of the first sequences is called Pillows, and it's about pockets, bees, stamps, legs. Uh, um, so there's a kind of defiant uh, marking out of territory. Is that how you saw it? Well, I think what I've found with it, objects sometimes have... I suppose it comes from the, you know, the development of the idea of, of things having their etheric or auric side, and they have a representation outside their basic materiality that... Like the, I mean, studying a lot of Eastern ways of viewing things, that you don't just have the physical, that you have other elements that things contain. And I suppose many objects do contain our consciousness and our dreams. We put um, we put our aspirations into objects, and they come to represent the inner parts of ourselves. And I think that section pillows, which does deal with um, objects, even buckets for washing and colours of, of clothes coming out in the wash and the, the idea that fire, you can see fire in objects and one book becomes a kind of um, ritualistic touchstone. Different objects and pockets become like that too and pillows, touchstones to opening into other like sort of circles of, of life or significance rather than just the purely physical impression or the, you know, what you've face with first and I find that fascinating. So they have a, the objects have a kind of aura about yeah, them. Or the poem you, put, actually... you project your own meanings over time with into those objects. So is that why you're fascinated with um, uh, retail displays, advertising, um, oh. television, overt commercialism, well, where that... the objects are blown up or pumped with significance or shown actually physically in a kind of um, alluring light? No, I think and that's that part. That's the other side of the material, which material. This thing, material, it hides the other layers, which accrete these layers through your own relationship over time yes. with them or need. And then there's the other materialism, which is like consumerism, which is often false and misleading because it's forced upon you with the um, 
the motive really is to make as much money as possible out of these objects with, um, I suppose, late capitalism. And they, become, they make them into fetishes for you, but in fact the aim is to sell as many as... So, so the people who make them and own those companies make money, which of course introduces a strand, um, I suppose that's my kind of social criticism, that also has come through my writing um, into my most recent book, Brush, with the um, series of poems, Bluff, on the financial. But yeah. I was always following this through. So that I've got one side about objects, which is a kind of spiritual or psychic dimension. A true aura, a true yeah. aura. Yeah, and then you've got the other side, which is a kind of... Um, a false not, aura. Not, not quite, yeah. Um, yeah, it's not quite, maybe it's, it's honest to them, you know, to a, a banker, etc. But, yeah, it's false or misleading and manipulative and, I suppose, economic politics and social. I mean, you also get a social portrait of these um, objects... So th that's, and then have people relate to them. Yeah. So that's where the social satire yeah, in, in, your, yes. in your poetry comes in, in yes. its attitude towards these uh, uh, falsely alluring um, yeah. uh, representations. You see, in, in my writing, I think sometimes it's often been presented as you know, satire, but there's the other side which I try and balance it, the more esoteric nature of things or thoughts or ideas to me, it's just as it's not, maybe not as immediately apparent because it's esoteric, but the satiric, parodic, um, my look at the way we live, contemporary living, seems to be the one which is gets the more the emphasis attention. than the other. But yes. the other is just as important to me. Yes, um, you call it esoteric, but in yeah. fact, it's domestic usually, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, but I, that, mean, I mean that's where you the, get the, the domestic grows into the esoteric because that is the domestic. There's the outer domestic, and then the inner domestic, I suppose, what a home or what all those objects mean to you as part of your own poetics of space, so to speak. Yes. Um, I mean, you've got a poem about the brown casserole dish. Yeah, well, in some ways then, in um, my book Aerial Photography, for example, which I got a grant for, so I had to do projects, I wanted to do on the elements with one of them, the projects, and so I, I used things like the fridge, for example, which involves lots of elements of, you know, of um, the earth and food, etc., etc., and water, all those things. And that turned into a, also a poem about religion, like as if it was a religion, the way we adore the family fridge. And that's a kind as of like... a kind of arc. You yes. open the fridge and inside are yes. all the so sacred I'm elements. Sort of mm. Doing many things at once, like sending it up, but also seeing it in a, in a spiritual context. And then I did one about the microwave oven, for example. So as I talked about um, them, but that was sort of more playful, I think, some of those objects like that. It was more the domestic playful, not so much... Um, the spiritual not, yeah, such, yeah. not like in the, um, the sequence pillows, for example, where, the, where the objects are something more personal and, well, not nostalgic, but there's um, a number of other more subtle, soft, mm. um, inner qualities to those objects. There's quite a dynamic quality to your treatment of objects and, and certain ambivalence too. I think you can go yes. from a negative to a positive, uh, particularly in those uh, poems which are set in the retail sphere, sphere in the public domain. Yeah, uh, because they do have s several, I mean, they, they do have nourishment for people, I think, in some ways, which I try to show that because sometimes there's nostalgia in my writing about shopping and objects and intimate moments, not just about um, critiquing the idea of, of, of the shopping experience, because there is um, there is a lot that the kind of sustains people, but also yes. there's a good way of t taking a kind of a there's a poem sharp that, eye. Yeah, there's a poem that. of yours about um, you know the the middle class habit of um, congregating in cafes on Saturday mornings, yes. which I think begins with a line, they have become intimate with the street. That's right, yeah. <laughs> so it's that kind of intimacy which um, you're not entirely scornful of. No, I mean, that came from a se whole series on real estate called Brief Lendings, yes. which I got that title from King Lear off Brief Lendings, with a nice little pun because it's also about tenants and, and real estate, the whole thing. But that covers not nostalgia as well as sharp criticism, as the shopping does. and. Uh, Many of my series do have that kind of 
double side, like with the spiritual, there'll be somewhere there's a kind of affinity and fascination and intimacy in what I've written. On the other hand, there's a quite a savage kind of slap as well, or, or parody. The sense of being exploited. Lampooning. Yeah, yeah but yeah. against the sense of being exploited yeah. uh, or coerced yeah. or intimidated in yeah. some way. You have got a poem about shopping there. Yes, I like this one. It's one I really still enjoy to read. It's, um, I wrote a whole series on shopping um, in, nine, in the late 70s, although this book wasn't published till 88. And this is like a little shopping philosophy. Other pieces there um, tell stories, narratives. Um, there's quite a lyrical one about shopping bags, but this one is just called In Particular. And it's a very short prose poem, but I think within it, the rhythms and the way it rolls out, in the way the, li the lines of the prose poem rather than the line break poem, give it a kind of um, rhythm of the ruminating over what shopping could be in a kind of um, interior way. In particular, you can go out shopping without really knowing what it is you're needing. Something makes you go out looking. There's a vague sense of knowing, but there's nothing in particular you can imagine you want. It's just that you haven't got enough of that which you think you might need. You believe you will locate it somewhere out there in one of those shops which you may fail to realise are, after all, only yet another series of rooms. We find a certain purpose in the movement from shop to shop, shelf to shelf. It seems to be more plausible than just sitting down. I'd like to move now to the, um, your use of language and uh, the sense in which uh, words for you are, in a way, like objects, they can, or rooms even, uh, they, they can be opened up into their different meanings and their um, ambiguities. And uh, this too affects the uh, style and the form in which you write. I yeah. wonder if you could say more about uh, your use of language. Uh, I mean, obviously there's a performative aspect to it, uh, but also uh, with those stripped down poems of yours where the words are being given all the room they need to resonate. Well, I would talk the um, use of language like conscious rather than just when you're writing and you're, you're writing something and you're trying to get the best word. But in recent times, since the um, starting with um, footnotes of a hammock, I started to sometimes write about actually about phrases like um, the title poem of footnotes of a hammock, which looks at different ways of looking at the phrase the silence of the world. And I see that as maybe a shift in um, picking up phrases and what they might mean. And sometimes I use phrases out of common sort of idioms just to begin a poem, like um, if I think of it, something like that. But the poem itself, in one of those poems, some of those poems are in um, the Illustrative History of Dairies. The actual, using very common like, idioms, but the poem itself is a quite strange scenario. And I like to play with that too. I remember those, a phrase, I think it might have been from that sequence of poems, the silence of linoleum. Yes. That, that, um, so that, that's a mixture again of the spiritual and the yes, physical, but uh, a wonderful play on, on the syllables, the, right. the silence of linoleum. Right. Uh, so there's well, a kind of materiality, is. isn't there, to your appreciation of language, I think. Yeah, but also um, in, in um, Amphora, the book, Again, I, I had a project to look and play with language. And so I did a number, I did a section of um, prose poems called um, Amphora, and they were individual ones, like little narratives where I actually took the idiom and imagined it was literal, for example. She kept her distance, um, fishing for compliments, collecting or gathering dust, um, running out of running out of time in the nick of time, um, dip my lid, like all these different ones. And I made them um, up in the air. I found a saint who was actually, did go up in the air. So I found I was mixing up, like I was writing about saints in one section, but then the saints would have to come into other sections. And I had a lot of fun imagining the literal manifestation of these idioms. It was great fun to do. 
indeed. And also, um, then I did the section uh, Pogo in that book with language, playing with like how words sounded for fruit in German or French, etc. Um, how a word like pop it, all its different meanings, playing with words and their meanings like dice or one called O, which is about place names, which I've got um, different place names and what they um, might mean. I feel it also explains your um, attraction to uh, areas of activity which have their own vocabularies or, or uh, their own rhetoric, uh, particularly uh, the financial side, the stock exchange, hedge funds and bull and bear markets and, uh, you know, that whole uh, uh, kind of rhetoric around the trading money, basically. Yes, well, that, that is something I, it's a recent, I mean, in the sense that I wrote them, I think the ones in in the book Brush, the first sequence, Bluff, um, are centred on, on the, the language of finance and playing with it. And I realised looking back, I've had a number of poems about finance, one in Penelope's Knees about a $50 note that was passed around. But that's a story. But in um, Bluff, what I started, I thought, I started looking at the financial pages of the paper and realising how much poetic language, like metaphoric language, figurative language is in it. Hmm. And then I started to just take a few examples, but then I just riffed. I, just, I looked at the financial pages a bit, but then I just went with it, with the uh, my imagination and some of the terms, but I had such fun, it was a fantastic liberation to do that, just play with it and not get angry like it may be in Adrenaline Thick Knife as the first section has a section called Tracks Towards the Third Millennium where I talk about developers in Sydney and all developers in high rise. But there's a sort of anger in it. Whereas in um, Bluff I think I had a great a great time um, imagining sort of cartoonish situations and this what I saw was that you could see in finance everything's an opportunity if you're up one minute you're down the next up and down up and down it's like a kind of animated like those animated graphs things are always busy and anything is I wanted to bring in the link between especially in um, the time we live in in the urban this obsession with the food and money now food is now the you know food and money, everything is somehow connected with money. And, uh, and food, of course, has its own. For it. But food also has its own elaborated uh, vocabulary, which, you, well, which yes. you play on, I think. Uh, I yeah. remember a poem which hinged on the word jus, jus, that's right. that's J-U-S. Right. That's what I did. And there's one poem in, in there that says that olives so new they're still on a tree or something yeah. like that, you know, yeah. playing with it's a... It's a poem about pizza, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, I just wanted to ask you in that connection in relation to language. It seems to me your poems uh, move between two extremes in a way. On the one side there are the very stripped down poems that you talked about before which are in a sense the poems of your origin as a, as a poet but uh, which really dominate I think in a collection like an, the Illustrated History, an Illustrated History of Dairies. Uh, where the poems are really quite short and very, very resonant and powerful. And on the other hand, the longer poems, which tend to be prose poems, and which are much more ruminative, ruminative meditative, and even diaristic. That is to say, there's a sense in which they fulfill the function, sometimes, of a kind of diary poem, in which you talk about you know things that have been happening to you or uh, impressions gained from the street. How do you talk about or how do you account for this uh, pen pendulum effect, I guess, in your poetry between the extremely, the minimalist on the one side and the expansive on the other? Well, I really like playing with different, um, I suppose I don't see myself as just um, mono form. I like the different ways of expression. Um, and I suppose it's just a sort of poly, poly form that I like. Um, the short, sharp poem I really like too, or even the prose fragment. But perhaps this comes into um, that moving, the ruminative, also comes into, I think, the um, how I started to write prose poems, although some of them are very short. But I felt... Will we talk about that now? Yes. Yeah, that... At this stage? Well, can I take up then your point about the prose poem? Um, because you've been identified with the prose poem, yeah. haven't you? Yeah. Well, I started... I think... What happened after Adrenaline Flick Knife in the 70s um, was I wrote some other 
heavy kind of feminist, psychological, mythic inner poems, which I don't want to talk about now. There's a few of them in a shared book um, called Radio City 2AM. But I felt the need that I was, my language had sort of got too heavy and too dramatic, too much sound, too much alliteration, too much of everything with the line break because of the, the sort of short, sharp shaping of everything. So it's like many, many, too much at once. So, and I started to feel reading some time, I think at that time of women's writing, just letting it, people writing about how they were living and writing sort of um, just, I suppose, memoir and stories of the real of their real life rather than invented life. I started to move into a kind of short prose, which I also um, a short prose poem, and I like that because it's I seem to be able to drop a lot of that intensity of language and use more um, ordinary um, language of speaking and talking, and just it seemed to um, allow a freedom freedom to just um, write what you're thinking or talking about and that often that kind of writing in the colloquial sometimes brings insights which the more poetic and um, the artifice of poetry in the line break doesn't doesn't um, provide though of course there are many poets who have been able to with line break like Ken Bolton use that talking thinking talking in the in the line poem but I wanted to try the prose poem, and I just started to do it, and I really enjoyed it. And um, you can still, of course, use use the qualities of poetry, but it's in a different kind of um, feeling, a different, a different um, aesthetic. And I started to develop the idea, and I started to write a lot more prose poems. That sometimes the poetry I wrote this down in a in a book, poetry, poetry and gender, UQP an anthology edited by David Brooks and Linda, Brenda Walker, that the poem was a show-off and wanted to be noticed, whereas the prose poem is more humble and more quiet. The poem says, hey, hey, look at me, and the prose poem says, find me. Um, that might explain why some of the prose poems are very, or many of them, are rooted in place. Mm -hmm. That is to say they have an ambulatory quality, not yes. just a ruminative one, mm -hmm. and they move from place to place. Uh, they may be physical places, but they may also be places mm. in memories. That is, they can go from one memory to another. But it gives I, you room. I think that, that line just takes you. It's the language of the world, the movement yeah. of just the order. And then you f find things unusual and suggestive and you, the rhythms come in. Whereas for a time I thought the poem, I didn't want to do um, line break. But then I came back to it quite strongly in the early 90s. And I do a bit, of, I do more line break now than prose poems. But it was a real liberation in a way. And of course, I was very much attracted to some of the prose poems of um, of um, Julio Cortazar, the Argentinian writer, very um, writing of strange and cryptic, unusual. Mm. He writ written novels, of course, but I liked what I call his prose poems, some of his instruction manual, you know, um, um, uh, how to wind a watch, and really amazing, unusual kind of um, possibilities within the with the prose poem. It plays very strongly that form yes. uh, into your groundedness, if I may call yeah. it that. You know, your interest in objects because it's often yeah. an object or a detail that will start the rumination. Yeah, but well, it also uh, plays into your uh, surrealist bent. You know, your your yeah. ability to uh, take an ordinary object and exaggerated or intensified to the point where it becomes quite detached from its own well, Cortazar, context. Well, I found this book, um, which David Brooks mentions he was influenced too, by, after I came back from India in 81, I found this anthology called Another Republic, and there was prose poems in translation, and there was a, a Cortazar in there, and I just loved how to, instructions on how to wind the watch, how to brush hair, and there was also Herbert, you know, the Polish Herbert or George Herbert. Yeah. Um, and I'd read him before, but like they were all in there with Lotten Borges, but um, and I also was interested in Francis Ponge. Et, the, yeah, et, all et, very et cetera, objects. Et and I just yeah. love that. I love the, what they did and I felt it very mm. it was a, like a kind of the, breakthrough that mm. you had the freedom of the short of just letting the lines go, but underneath there was something coming out. But I used to say the poem po prose poem was more humble. But now I see it more, sometimes more sly and revealing itself. Humble was a bit too sort of, you know, 
go back to basics because the poem, I used to talk about the poem was like a temple, you know, because you saw the shape, you must, it must be significant, whereas the prose poem was more humble. But now I think perhaps it's more sly. And I also, I've been thinking about it because you can't, over the, over the decades, what I think of the prose poem compared to what I thought about it originally when I found it as a, a pathway of liberation, so to speak, um, the that, that um, the prose poem somehow makes something unreal real because it's the language of the world, the everyday. The, well, the prose poem language I usually use is not like a kind of Baudelaire kind of correspondences, oh. you know, and it, the, the French more decorative, not decorative, but embellished. I like, the, I like the word sly because yeah. there's an encyclopedic potential uh, which Cortazar obviously and Borges play on, um, Ponge too. Uh, you know, the sense that the ordinary world has all sorts of interesting things in it, um, but you've got to be alert to where they are. Like yeah. it could be a bar of soap, for example. That's right. That's right. Um, and the, the slyness is there in that knowledge, that kind of knowledge of where things are, you know, where the interesting things are. Yeah, it's just, it's just there. I mean, you don't have to mm. go very far. No. It's there, right there. A lot of those prose poems, I think, are uh, centred in uh, your territory, which uh, is that uh, sense of place. They give a very strong sense of place from uh, the eastern suburbs, from King's Cross through to Watson's Bay, really, Rushcutter's Bay and so on. Uh, Darling Point and yeah. um, Double Bay. Um, can you talk about uh, that that area, its importance to you? Well, I, I, a lot of them are actually in line break poetry too. But I, I do write about it a Bondi lot. Bondi Beach, but, for example. Well, the Bondi yeah. Beach one, yes, and that came out of, um, there was a, um, some of the poems I've got came from actual projects where someone was having, doing an anthology online. There's weeks about Sydney beaches. Hmm. And so I thought, oh, well, I'll write about Bondi Beach because I had a lot of experience growing up at Bondi Beach. So I was able to put different phases or different aspects of Bondi Beach into, into a four part, I think five part. So that, that was um, gathering together a whole lot of history. It suddenly became, um, became a poetic territory. And I think in the first stanza of that, I talk about a teenage, um, teenage lover of Keats or poetry or something. And, Ode to Depravity, it must have been an early poem, I remember it. As you came down, because Bondi in the winter, of course, because the buses used to wind around and you'd come down the hill and you would see it. And I sort of saw it in the, that time, in the realm of romantic, romantic poetry and sort of depressive, depressive kind of imagery. So I went through various phases of Bondi, which was something which... Um, and it was full of uh, Eastern European migrants at the time. Yes, as I well, know, in the 60s, it was, but definitely 50s. they used to be, I used to go with... Um, some Polish friends on Sunday, with a lot of Europeans down there on Sunday um, afternoon. Promenading. And, yeah, and then there was the Pronto Pups, that, that, that battered hot dog place with the, with the neon lights. I didn't put Pronto Pups into the, um, into, the, um, into the piece on Bondi, but I managed to cover a whole lot of the, the German man who came and had to, had to do, I think that's in about the third stanza of that poem. But I remember poems also about um, King's Cross. Weren't yes. you educated in the, uh, yeah, I went in to the school Catholic in school Point. In, in Potts Point? Yes, yes which is in still Vincent's. there. Vincent's. And that, that's what I, in Penelope's knees when going back to the school and everyone jumping up and down on the, on the, um, the kneelers. You always had to go to, on the way home, you had to go to the chapel and say a prayer before you could leave the school. And if you didn't, you'd be in trouble. So you'd rush in and I'd put that in that. Penelope's knees, mm. and um, yes, it's quite it's a It's quite few precise. I mean, uh, there's a poem about um, having a cup of coffee outside 21, the Cafe 21 in Double Bay. Um, yes, that was, I think was the, um, I've done a whole, it was like a pro prose poem essay on places where I read, yes, called that's right. over the page. Yeah. And um, yes, reading Camus at 21. That's right, reading at Camus 21 at 21. In, in about 1963, <laughs> I used to like to do that. With, with all the uh, glamorous uh, yes. ladies walking past. Yes, because yeah, you could have the double, the double world, you know. And also, I think when I was younger and you know, living at home, I used to like to go out walking and in Penelope's Knees, where Penelope, the, uh, it's a kind of parodic odyssey, where Penelope walks around, her knees have, give her a problem, but I cover all those areas. It's a long-lined poem, Penelope's Knees, and she travels around the eastern suburbs and you get a whole description of walking mm. past the mm. hospital and 
down to, um, of course, very luckily, is Ithaca Road, so it's perfect, you know, because I used to live in Ithaca Road. And she, Penelope goes down Ithaca Road, and then there's the water there with the boat, so you've got all those classical Greek references just there in front of you to, to talk about, you know, and boys on skateboards like the Hermes. So you've got all these different figures there within the odyssey of Penelope's... Um, is Penelope's that, knees. Is that your sense of the harbour, a, a kind of a Hellenic sense of it? Sometimes. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of possibilities, yeah. I think, for the harbour. Um, you yes, talk about it, you can see it in many different ways, I mm. guess. I, I did write a poem once about Watson's Bay too, but I haven't put it in, in the book. Um, so I have written... But of course, the harbour is very important because, although people don't know this, it doesn't say it, but the, the title poem, or title post poem from, from On a Clear Day, which was on the HSC a no, several times for a number of years, um, the image of the inner world that the character has inside her ear, which she can't get to, is like another surreal place to go. Um, and that's playing around with New Age consciousness, and, the, and of course the ear does look a little bit like it comes from the water. Like a this labyrinth. is actually based on red leaf images from Red Leaf Pool, which was very in important mm. in my early childhood. I've got a photo of me at four at Red Leaf, and I went there as a very young child. Other times I went to Nielsen Park, Watson's Bay, but Red Leaf has a very deep significance for me, and I, I um, was like, it's like heaven. And so on a clear day where the character hopes to find um, the kind of benign sort of heaven in, in, the, in this particular place in the water, with um, its enormous depth of this sea that thrilled her most. It's based on my my reading and my experiences at Red Leaf. So that is a very um, significant. Um, I've used Red Leaf at numbers of times for swimming poems. And you were a swimming teacher. I for did a while. do some swimming teaching, yes. yes. In the, um, and blowing bubbles in the that, that fast comes lane, from those that, times that sees the swimming pool as a kind of centre of the universe. Yeah, well, with a whole group of casual teachers. Um, that we were able to get these jobs in the summer teaching swimming and they were, the school children came and we'd have different groups of children come all, all the school day like lessons and we travel around, we went to different swimming pools in the inner west mainly and uh, a lot of those, the whole sequence comes out of that experience, blowing bubbles in the seventh lane, it's a kind mm. of collage. Of so, swimming pools. Mm. Yeah, so um, parts of Sydney are very, um, very, um, manifest in my writing. There's another poem, um, in, in Brush, the one about um, Harbinger, about Sydney too, and that um, deals also with um, areas Elizabeth Bay and Rose Bay Flying Boat Base and the Winter Garden Theatre is mentioned there. Yes, you mentioned that yeah. going to the Winter Garden Theatre with your yeah. father when it was a, a, a cinema. Yeah, so it's a kind of, and also there's um. Another, interestingly, I've thought the Rushcutters Bay Park. Now, I think I've got about three poems based on Rushcutters Bay Park, and each time they're different. Um, and the one in in Brush, which is, um, it grows on you, is actually a kind of layered internal meanings that have meaning to me based on that park, whereas in another book I wrote about that park, much more in terms of, it's sort of physicality more, I think. But this one, of course, you would never know it was Rush Cutters Bay Park, but there are lots of meanings and things I've put in it because the park develops layers of significance to do with different histories I've experienced there and invented. But it's amazing how that park's changed in my time and the way it um, it has developed. Mm. From I being remember it empty too, yeah. And then now it's... Incredible so busy you wouldn't believe mm. it. it's a different it's but, lost its magic in a way for me yeah. now but that's yeah. what i meant that the poems taken as a whole yeah. you know, do, do provide a, quite an intense often private uh, geography uh, of the eastern suburbs um, yeah, that you are in, in a sense you know the poet of that place uh, you mentioned several times uh, how the sequences of poems uh, arose out of projects and um, the idea of the project uh, seems to be important for you. I wondered to mm -hmm. what extent um, each book was a new 
project, a new setting out. I mean, to what extent do you approach a collection as exploring a, a new aspect of your poetry or new forms? Uh, um, to what well, I think, to, yeah. well, I think some of the books grow out of projects which you, you know, that you have to apply sometimes to Australia Council for a project. Mm. So you find something you're interested in, so you make the project expand. And they're ones which you have consciously put together. So you have to really explore and you have a lot more in, in that sequences because you've committed yourself to that, because you want to do it, but that's a project. But then you also need to have, I think, things that just happen. Like, for example, in a number of my books, I will have a, a grouping which come together just as unexpectedly. And there are some which you start with the idea and work on and then um, develop as you go because you like what's happening and you think you've got more to say, which is different to the ones that you have to plan for because you apply for a grant. And I just wonder whether sometimes those projects for grants, you know, is always the best way to go. I'm not sure. I think you need a bit of both. But you have a reputation for, as someone who's constantly trying out new forms. Yeah, oh yes, or definitely. whose poetry is marked by its diversity of forms. Yes. Well, I like, I, like, I, like, I like to do that because I think um, that the self has many different ways of expressing itself. And um, it's just full of the, you know, the pleasure of possibility of the ways you can use language and ways you can get ideas and different ways you might use return to the same subjects, but you're always doing them in slightly different ways, mm. I think. Um, One of those forms... Um which we've been talking about, the stripped down poem, often with uh, quite uh, radical uh, jumps or discontinuities, um, causes you to be uh, seen as obscure in some sense or difficult. Uh, I wonder how you respond to that. I mean, even the latest um, review of Brush by the poet, Jessica Wil Wilkinson, a uh, young poet, um, says that you know she had to read the book three times before it started to make sense. Right. Uh, I wonder what you felt about that. I mean, you're obviously not being deliberately obscure or anything like no, that. No, I think it was probably the idea because because you move around to different forms of writing. Because as you start, you've got the the poems, um, the financial ones, which are a bit um, cryptic, and you have to just go for the ride because I jump around a lot because. I'm trying to emulate the um, the kind of rhythm and the the speed the of speed the of it all. Credit. Yes, mm. the speed of it all, and then you you move on to to prose poems. You suddenly change, I've suddenly changed direction in the mood, and they're kind of single ones and sometimes quite slow and dreamy. And then you've got the day poems. So you're moving around a lot. And then you've got the the section in the middle, road, which was a kind of like all the poems that seemed to be about ways of being in the world now and it's a kind of road like it, whatever happens on the road so they're not they're not grouped like a prod like the financial was a project the road ones are just ones that grew from the you know whatever happened and became i thought road is a good place to put them all because they're just the ones that happen but i like to have some that happen and some that you're working on because then you've got a it's like a kind of cave when you work on a project you have a cave in which your mind can think about all the different ways you can manifest something. But then you like to have the ones that are just spontaneous and happen. And I like to have a whole lot of those different kinds of genesis of what you're writing and then the process. It keeps you feeling like you've got to... I always think of the... Um, if you have a project which you haven't committed yourself to externally, for example, but you say, I'm going to work on that, like the financial ones. I looked at when I started and my records on the computer yesterday and I started the financial ones whether in Bluff, 2009, the last one was 2013 on the dates of the files. But if you have that and you've got something to write about, you don't have to be writing, but you're gathering all the time. And I often think of the, um, when I was in Kashmir briefly, in Srinagar in 1981, which I'd love to go back to, but can't, they used to have a little braziers of coals, the men inside their clothes to keep them warm, though I think it might have been pretty dangerous at some stage, but they used to carry them under their cloaks for winter. Not that I was there in winter, but I know of that. And I think of that like that, that those projects that I'm working on slowly, 
inside my head and you write them as they come, even if they take a long while, I suddenly, and then suddenly you think that's enough. But there's like a little fire inside you that keeps you going, even if you're not writing. So you need those projects. So I suppose they become more personal and develop their own little auras as well, which you don't, you know, just become like that. Um, On that uh, point of uh, they keep you going, um, uh, that's, I think, an important question to ask you because um, uh, because you have this reputation of uh, being difficult or, uh, you know, requiring uh, a number of readings. So I feel that, you know, you haven't been recognised sufficiently as a poet. And um, on the other hand, you've been amazingly productive, you know, there's quite a few books of collections, all of which are important, but you haven't won that many, you haven't won prizes, oh, right. you don't get shortlisted. Uh, it's diff I know as a publisher it's difficult to get reviews. So I wondered what kept you going, you know. <laughs> how, do oh, you well. how do you handle that, that lack of a response? Well, I, some of the things that probably go against me in, the, in Australia, I'd say, is lower case. <laughs> but that's so trivial, really. I know, but that's, that's, it's a number of things because I don't, I'm not consistent. I don't believe in consistency. I'm just, you know, you go where the mood takes you, in the mood. Although in the mood in this book was like in the mood for prose poems when you want to just meander and focus on some little rumination or invention. This, um, I'm not consistent people. There's a like a unify, unity is is privileged unity and form and coherence, know, yeah. coherence. Mm -hmm. And of course, I'm all over the place. It's um, it seems that you know there she is again. Or you know, I can go because I go from maybe the outwardly satiric to the inwardly cryptic, or play some language, play around with some language, and play around with the poetry of distraction, which I suddenly then. Having done that section road where there are lots of poems which I suppose are like jump cuts and mashes and all the different words now sampling, they're of that kind of... But then suddenly I move into the autobiographical. Now, because I think in, also in poetry there are very fierce schools of how what poetry should be, um, that, you know, they, they don't cross over all that much because I'm split in different, you know, that maybe I'm not not serious enough about poetry. All those different things, I think, operate. So, you know, I mean, if you want to write in an iconoclastic sort of way, I suppose you just have to do it. You know, you take, you know the, the climate that you're working in, and that's just how it is. And if it really comes down to the pleasure for yourself, I think, as I get older, that it's the pleasure I get from getting the idea and playing with the writing and doing it that is the mo most important because, as you know, many people who are su so outside successful, they're not necessarily enjoying their work or enjoying the pleasure. They're more concerned about the competition and who's going to get the prize. I think that, you know, consumed with it, some people, I would imagine. Um, so I think the pleasure, the, if it's not pleasing you and it's not nourishing you and enjoy it, just for the sake of, because I always write and scribble bits of paper or pieces. I never go straight on the computer with the glossy screen. And I have bits of paper and I love that. I put them in, I like to have them all over it because I feel like they're just in, their possibilities not, not definite. And it's a kind of sense of not um, realising or completing something until the time comes. So, and sometimes I don't, I don't type things up for quite a while. I don't even type, I've got, File files of things I don't type up until I get in the mood to do it. It might be a year even. So I just find that the personal pleasure is more important than anything else because, as we know, mortality comes and who knows who will be remembered in the future. So you might as well enjoy yourself. And that's sufficient. The best pleasure, yeah. Well, that's, that's sufficient well, to, to, some, you do need to keep the indifference at bay, is that? You do need recognition, but... You've also got to recognise why you why you did this work, it was for pleasure really, and something that that um, inside you. I really like playing with language. I think that's a, how I've changed. That I really love the wordplay, and I love how, although it seems like you know humans have created the language, but somehow language is it's like its own force, and it has. Once you start pulling it apart, it has so many different meanings and potentials. It's like a kind of, well, I wouldn't use the word garden, but it's like a just endless cosmos of, of, 
of combinations. You put a word, you change a letter, and you've got something else. You put it in a different context, and the words just have this. Well, English. I mean, I, you know, free English anyway. I'm only speaking about English, but I've also liked to put some. Like I did a bit of span, learned a bit of Spanish, and I like it. And I like to play with some of the meanings which I did in a poem here. Um, one in road called extract and I've really had fun just playing and punning with a few Spanish words even. Like, do, you, yeah. do you keep an archive of all your possibilities? Well when I was young I used to tear up drafts. But do you mean archive of, of possibilities? I mean do you keep, do you have filing cabinets and, and you keep well, all, all got your one drafts? Filing. Everything's in different, one filing cabinet boxes, plastic boxes, cardboard boxes, drawers, all variety. There's no one type of place where I, I change. I used to write maybe more on, um, I'd use different kinds of paper, maybe A4 sometimes, maybe I like to do those Mimo cubes, and write little things in small pieces of paper and then just put them, now I'd sometimes put them in little plastic bags, all the ones that go together and then I'll, I'll use them later, snap locks. You know, it's just varied. I, I never keep consistent. I'm not but you consistent. keep things. You keep things. Yeah, I keep it all. Yeah, yeah. So I've changed. I've changed. I don't know what I'll do next, really.